Thank you for joining us at First Assembly of God Church in Clear Lake, California. Please welcome our associate pastor, Chris Massengill. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to minister your word today. Lord, I ask that you take this word that we have prepared together and you'd open our eyes and our ears to see what you're saying to the church today. Pray that you would uh, step into the hearts of each and every person that's here today, Lord. I pray that nothing be said here that isn't glorifying to you. But mostly, Lord, I pray that we would just be loved by you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You guys ready? How many came expecting today? Man, much better than the first service. You know, the first service is getting better. Last week, it was like, you know, three people. And this week, it was like two-thirds of the people, so it was really good. You know, but today, today's really going to be a rough one. So are you ready for that? So um, a couple Sundays ago, just before I ministered on a, the last Wednesday that I ministered on where I gave some statistics, um, I said that if you were weak, if your spirit man was weak, that you might want to weigh out whether you should come or not when I was preaching the next few messages. And that next Wednesday, only about half of you showed up. So I'm glad you all showed up here today because, you know, I believe that God is raising up an army. And we should know the times and the signs of where we're at right now. So, I'm just going to say this. The good thing about what we are going to be teaching on today is those that of us that believe and we're ready and we're looking for won't have to experience the things that we're going to talk about today. So if you are born again, last week, Pastor gave a message which really works well for right now. He said that, is saved enough? And he talked about a covenant in a marriage situation where sometimes you, know, you come up, you say the vows, then you, know, then you move to another country. You're still married to that person, but you're not with them. And so I'm just going to tell you what I mean. He said that if you are with God now, you'll be with him then. I want you to get that right now because if because all the worries, put all your worries aside. Don't worry if you're ready. Don't worry if you're making the right moves. Don't worry if you're holy enough. The biblical, what we talk about here is if you're with him now, you'll be with him then. So I need to illustrate that. I've been married to Teresa now for 18 years. We have been in covenant together. And I am with Teresa. But most of you know, I am with Teresa. Every morning I wake up, the first thing I do is I look over to see if she's still breathing. <laughs> she, she breathes kind of heavy when she's sleeping, so I usually don't have to guess. I just kind of know. So the first thing I do is I listen. Okay, she's okay. Then I roll out of bed because I get up much earlier in her. I have stuff I have to do with the Lord because that's, you know, I'm married to him too. Yeah, kind of some but anyway. Um, so I, that's the first thing I do. And, you know, um, whenever I, everything we do, we do together. There isn't a decision made that we don't do together. Sometimes somebody will ask, hey, can you do this on that day? I don't know, ask my wife because I don't know what we're doing because I'm with her. Whatever I do outside of the home while I'm working, I'm always thinking about my wife and how it would affect her because I'm with her. Many times during the day, we're 20 plus miles apart. She'll text me, I'll text her because we're just kind of communicating back together because I'm with her. Even to the point that when I come to church, I have to make sure how I am dressed because how I am dressed reflects her. I hope the church is listening to me right now. Are you with the Lord? Or did you just say the vows and move to the other part of the country? Are you just say the vows and you're showing up at church? But you're not with him. 
There's not a, a very few mornings that my wife does not get up before I leave the house to make sure I can look and see where she's at physically and mentally, and she can see where I'm at physically and mentally. Because we're with each other. Are you with him? So you're probably thinking, Pastor Chris, if we're not going to be here and we're not going to see it, why are you teaching on it? Because I'm here to tell you, the hoofbeats of the four horses in Revelation are already galloping around the globe. And it is good that we know the times and the seasons that we're in. So let's get started. Matthew 24, verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? Now if you were here the Wednesday that I spoke, I actually took all the data that I had of how many countries are at war, talking about famine, all the different signs. I believe it opened the eyes of a lot of people that were here that night. That's when half of you didn't show up. But um. So I'm going to say, if you didn't see that, if you weren't here, you might want to grab that and look at it. Go to the website, punch it in, it'll come up, and you can watch that, because this one could seem a little chaotic or, you know, confusing to you. But I gave the signs about how, you know, the UN has already said we're going to have a global famine, that global food crisis. We talked about it in the book of Revelations where it talks about they come across the Euphrates River into Israel to battle them, and we talked about how the Euphrates River is drying up as we speak. There's a city that's been underwater for thousands of years and now is visible. We talked about drought. You know, we've always had drought and famine in other countries and other places, and every generation's had it, but, you know, we've never had it global. It's never been all at once. So if you didn't get that, you might want to take it because it's time for the church to wake up. No, not yet. She's on T. She's got it. See, they're all, they're all expecting. Okay, set the time. Push, push the little red button. Uh-huh, push it up. Uh-huh. Well, you had to set the time so the alarm goes off. Anyway, she'll figure it out as we go along. <laughs> set it for 12 o'clock and it'll ding. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins and took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Good job, babe. <laughs> Time to wake up, church. He has, been, he has been delayed. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is coming. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming out of to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready, say those who were ready, ready. went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. For those who weren't here, we talked about how we worried about how we're going to deal with our leaving people here, that when we leave here in the rapture, we're going into the wedding supper of the Lamb, which is going to be seven days. And I gave you the, the visual of how when I was in drugs, this was my world. And when I decided to get, I got born again and started working in the church and coming into the church, I went over here. And now I'm in this world. That, that world's still there going on at the same time I'm in this world at the same time. But that world is no longer part of my world. And I could go back to that world anytime I want to, but I don't choose to because I'm pretty comfortable in this world. And though that I think about that world once in a while, I really don't carry much feelings about it because I'm grateful to be in this world. Just so will be when we step into the next one, we'll be so grateful to be at the wedding 
Supper of the Lamb that we really won't think too much. We might ponder a little bit, but we'll be so grateful that we're there that this won't weigh on us anymore. So those that were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. After the other virgins came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, As surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. I'm just going to mention this to you, church. They were all ten virgins. They were all ten undefined. Undefined. How do you say it? Defiled. It's thick up here right now. It's hard to keep track. They all probably came from the same house. They all had the same opportunity. But five were ready, and five were not. Five believed and was looking forward that he was coming, and five believed that, well, it's happened all these other generations. It's not happening right now. It's just another one of those things. So today we're going to talk about what the tribulation period might look like if you were to experience, if you're still here. Once again, remember, if you're with him now, you'll be with him then. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11, this is our text for today. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Now remember, when we started this series, we started in 1 Thessalonians 1, and we talked about how he was telling them how all the things, he said, how do we know we're ready? And we gave you a list of things of how to know you were ready. And he's telling them, you're doing these things, you're doing this and this. So he tells them, for, he says, I have no need that I should write to you, because they already understood that Jesus is coming. He didn't have to tell them these things. They already knew. They were already awake. For you yourselves know perfect, perfectly that the day of the Lord is, is so comes as a thief in the night. Going to have to say this again. Probably a, a major majority of us in the church today say Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction, everybody say sudden destruction, destruction. comes upon them. As labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. In other words, we are separate from the world. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. But let us wake up, watch, and be sober. For those who sleep, <laughs> thank you, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are in the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath. I want you to hear that. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you saved? Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, <laughs> we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also are doing. As we enter these times, there will be different times that we're in different levels of where we're at. There are times that I need to be lifted up, and there's times others need to be lifted up. And we need to edify and lift up one another as we go through these times, as we get sidetracked to the things that come, as we begin to worry. Let's remind us who we are in Him. Let's remind each other what His Word says. Because there'll be times you'll be in a situation and you can't see the word for yourself, so the Lord might have to have somebody else come tell you what the Word says for that situation. Let us not get ununified. I just want to, I was thinking that this morning. This church has never been so unified as it is right now, going into where God has taken us. Many times we have been there, and because of disunification, it has all fallen apart. But this time we have all humbled ourselves, grabbed each other together, and we are in this thing. For I believe the doors are about to get kicked open, and things are about to ha happen. This church is unified.
I had to ask the Lord, how do I teach on this subject and give it to you in a way that's memorable without getting you so bogged down in the details of the judgment of God coming on the earth? Because we can already see the birth pains, the labor pains that is about to come. Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 5, first thing I want to share with you, first fact that I can give you is sudden destruction. Sudden destruction. Verse Thessalonians 5, 3 says, For when they say peace and safety, I want you to pay attention, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. The Bible calls this day we're coming to the day of the Lord. What kind of day is it? Well, I want to tell you, it's not a 24-hour period. When the Bible uses the terminology, the day of the Lord, it is a period of time. You'll see it used in a more wider variety. The book of Daniel is very clear that this day is a seven-year period. Because when you see in the Bible, as many times when you see the day of the Lord, it's used as a much broader sense. It means a specific time or period of time when God intentionally judged the world of its sins. This time, the day of the Lord, equal or equivalent to the great tribulation, a seven-year period where God pours out his wrath. So we're going to look today to see how the Bible describes this seven-year period, this time of tribulations through his prophets. I want to remind you, this isn't a new modern-day thing. This isn't something we created in the 1900s. The prophets of old talked about this. In Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, a people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will ever be in any such after them, even for many successive generations. Joel says this day will be a day of trembling. I want to tell you the weird thing about this. The Sunday school that they taught on video for you to watch next week at Habakkuk talks about a day of trembling. Now me and Dan, we don't visit during the week. You might want to see that Sunday school thing too because somehow or another God has intervened that together and woven it together. He does that quite often in this church that the leaders are all speaking about the same thing and preaching on the same thing and we don't ever talk to each other about what we're preaching on. I just want to say this. It's a day that everybody trembles. And so if you were here on that Wednesday, I talked about how I can't say a certain word because we're on YouTube. And so we all know what that word is. It starts with a C. And so I had to come up with a way to explain that without saying it. So I came up with this word called biological complexities. <laughs> Pretty brilliant, Pastor Chris. I know, huh? <laughs> these variants that we have, these biological complexities... Has got everybody in turmoil and they're afraid. Wait until we enter that seven year period. You think they're crazy now. Here's how much it'll make you tremble. The first three and a half years of that period, approximately two billion people will die through warfare, famine, pestilence, disease, and the beast of the field. Let me say that again so you can get that down in your spirit. Warfare, famine, pestilence, disease, and the beast of the field. Could it be that we're seeing right now in this current um, complex biological complexities? Could it be coming from one of the beasts of the field? Or could it be something like that? Imagine two people dying in a three and a half year period. We can see what happened in the biological complexities that we face today with people dying all over the world in a short period of time. But to put this in perspective for you, we're looking at about 150 million 
globally have died from biological complexities. Imagine 20 times that. Three and a, or two billion people in three and a half years. Through warfare, famine, pestilence, disease, and the beasts of the field. If you think people are afraid now, they'll definitely be afraid then. The day of the Lord is coming. The Bible says it's a day of darkness and gloominess. The Bible says that during this time, it will be so tough, some people will seek death, but suicide will evade them. In other words, they'll want to die, but they can't. I know many times, there's been a few times in my life that I have made a right turn when I should have went left with the Lord. And, and I'm saying this for everybody. There was a time that I noted, once I made that choice, I had to go all the way to the end of the road. No matter how bad I felt, how many times, I had to go to the end. There had to be a lesson that I needed to go through and learn so it wouldn't happen again. Like the door was shut. Doesn't mean if you happen to miss it and you, the door is shut and you don't go to going. Doesn't mean you're going to hell. You might think you went to hell. You still can go to heaven. You just missed the rapture. They were all virgins, all ten. Five were ready, five were not. Just saying. They want to die, but they can't die. Jeremiah 30, verse 7 says, A loss, for that day is great, so that none is like it. None is like it. And it is a time of Jacob's trouble, but you shall be saved out of it. Are you saved? That's the question you need to ask yourself today. Am I truly saved? Am I with him now? Or am I playing church? Jeremiah said, There is no time like it. The world has never seen a time like this. The time that is coming. Now we've had some pretty bad periods of time in human history. You can look back to the days back in the day, how wicked it was and evil and all those things. And it says, never has it been like this time, ever. There will be a time people will tremble with fear. Luke 21, 25 through 28 says, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon and in the stars, and in the earth the stress of nations will perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming to the earth, for the powers of heavens will be shaken. People will have heart attacks by turning on the news and seeing what's happening. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud. Hallelujah with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Look up, lift up your head, because your redemption draws near. Daniel 12.1 says, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Are you saved? That's the question today. With all this bad information, scary information, really, if you are with him now, you'll be with him then. If your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, you will go to heaven. The prophets keep reiterating over and over to all of us, the world has never seen this kind of trouble that is going to come on the earth. Matthew 24, 21 says, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. Revelation 6, 15 through 17 says, And the kings of the earth, great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, Every slave and every free man hid themselves in caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? 
Could you imagine people being so afraid that they would run into the mountains and the caves and beg that they would fall on them? To hide them from the wrath of God that is coming upon this earth. I'm going to sum this up. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 through 6, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. We are separated. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those of us that are looking, that are ready, this day will not take us like a thief in the night. It's not going to seem like a fast thing to us that believe. It's going to seem like a slow thing, but because we can see the signs and they're coming. We can see the seasons. Like when we look at the fig tree. But to the unbelievers who are not looking at the signs of the times, doesn't know the word of God, doesn't have the Holy Spirit to lead them, it will come upon them like turning on a light switch. And sudden destruction. Just as fast as turning on a light switch. Everybody will be saying, peace and safety. Everything is good. Everything is prosperous. Economy's doing good. Everybody's doing well. Then all of a sudden, like a flip of a light switch, everything will change in a moment. I need you to hear me today, church. Everything will be going great. Everything will be doing well. The world will be prosperous. And then it will come like throwing a light switch. And everything will be changed. What changed? The rapture of the church is what changed. You think two people, two billion people dying in the first three and a half years is a major issue. How about this one? 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 52. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for when the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Statistically, approximately 2 billion people around the world that call themselves Christians will be caught up into this place. Caught up. So what you have first is the Lord coming in the clouds where 2 billion, 2 billion people leave this planet before this great day. So you can see this already being set up like the satanic world is already preparing for this. Everything you turn to in regular news right now, in, in the conspiracy world, started as conspiracy. We're not conspiracy theorists now. Now we're truthers because these things are coming true. Anyway. Um, but they're talking about how, you know, uh, aliens and UFOs and the Pentagon's releasing information about how we've always had UFOs and Bush knew about it. And they knew, oh, Trump knows about it. You know what I mean? And he's, and he's talking to aliens now. And how CERN turned on that they planted in the ground, this thing CERN. And it's going to open a, 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 a porthole to, the, to another realm so the demonic spirits can come in. And you got all this craziness talk going on. So when that day happens and two billion of us conservative Christians disappear here, They'll say, oh, the UFO people took them up out of here. And the world will be saying, hallelujah, them conservative Christians are no longer here to plant their stuff on us anymore. We can live like we want to live. Not knowing what's coming. You can see it. You can see the signs. 
they'll have to figure out a way to justify and explain how two billion people disappearing in a moment. The Bible says two will be walking in a field and one will disappear. Two will be grinding flour and one will disappear. They were all ten virgins. Five were ready, five were not. They'll have to explain how they disappeared in a moment, a twinkling of an eye, one one one-thousandth of a second. Think about that. Being caught up in the air to meet with the Lord. Just like that. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is coming back. We get the altar team to come up. And in a group of this size, there were always people thinking, I, I just don't believe it. I just can't receive it. I just don't understand it. I gave the illustration how we have walked out of one world into another world. As I explained to Colby one day, I was sitting in front of his house that he just got with his nice air conditioning and his pinball TV screen that he has in his house. And how well we were doing sitting in my new truck that was full of gas with money in our pockets heading to the gym so we can get healthier. And I said, you know, Colby, we sit here in front of your house With all this goodness, all this blessing, and two doors down from you is a man who just woke up and his kids are at the table wondering what they're going to eat and he has nothing to feed them. The first thing on his mind is how am I going to pay my rent and how am I going to get loaded today? As his kids sit at the table wondering what they're going to eat. We live in two separate worlds at the same time. Two separate worlds at the same time. And there's somebody here today, I got to tell you. It's time for you to put this world behind. You need just to walk away from everything that's tied to it. Whatever's holding you to it, you need to walk away and step into this world and give your life to Christ. Step in the kingdom. And trust me, I can prove it to you right now. As you walk in that kingdom, you will draw those who you love from there. It's a promise. The Bible says if you get saved, your whole household gets saved. Quit dealing over here. Step over here because we're about ready to step to a whole nother level of living. And you do not want to be left behind. Acts 1, 9 through 11. So now when he had spoken these things. They watched. I want you to see what I'm saying here today. They watched as he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you in heaven will soon... So come in a like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So as we open the altar here today. This could very possibly be the most important part of this service today. What are you trying to say, Pastor Chris? What are you trying to tell the church today? What has God told you to speak? I'm telling you, you need to get your lamps trimmed. You better get some oil of the Spirit of God in your life. You better stay awake. Because Jesus is coming in a moment when you think not. When you think not. I noticed today people are sending me all these messages of these great preachers that are talking about this now. And no one's really talked about it for a long time. Now they're all talking about it. I thought to myself, well, I'm glad the Holy Ghost has got me about three weeks ahead of all of them. Yeah. I doubt if they're watching my stuff. Yeah. 
He will come when a moment when you think not. Then there'll be a gathering together to meet the Lord in the air. Can you imagine the church service that we'll have on that day? Can you imagine? In the flip of a light switch, we leave this world and we step into the wedding supper of the Lamb where there's great celebration and everything is going on and we realize that we have made it and we were not left behind. That our lamps were full and we were ready. We were watching and we were ready. Oh, this, this church on top of this hill is ready for what's coming, I'm here to tell you. Imagine the church service we'll have when we get there. You think the worship was kicking this morning we're here and everybody's yelling. Imagine when we get there. I have to ask you today, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you right now? Heck with what I'm saying. What is the Holy Ghost saying to you right now? Is there something that you need to let go? Is there something that you need to forgive? Is there some kind of baggage you need to put aside? Maybe it's the name of a loved one who just came to your mind. The whole purpose of this series right here is not to make anybody afraid, but to make you realize that you need to get as many people in the boat before the door is shut. That you need to take what you have and take it outside these four walls of this church and share it with those who you work with, who you love, those walking on the street, those sitting on the park bench. Because if you're truly a Christian, you want nobody to go to hell. And living through the tribulations will be just like going to hell. What's he saying to you today? If you're here today and you've got a sickness, you've got something that's pulling on you, we serve a God who answers prayers. I beg you today to come allow one of these altar workers to minister to you. If there's something holding you back and you need just to repent over it, I pray that you would come forward, sit in the middle of the aisle, repent of that, spend your time in worship, do whatever you got to do to get right before you leave this place. If you're here today and everything's great, you're holier now, you're righteous as can be, then I would ask that you would stand while we worship for the last 10 minutes, five minutes, and allow God to move in this place to minister to those who need to be ministered to. But mostly I ask that you would not leave this place the same as you came in. Thank you for letting me preach.